Oh. I'm sorry, I thought I was host the whole time, and then as soon as it hit 310, I realized I wasn't the host, so I needed to figure that out. We have to do the bottom line this week ish. Um, okay, thanks everyone for coming uh, to our seventh Compass Lecture Series of Fall 2023 uh, semester. Um, today's speaker is Quentin Bonfoy. I'm sorry. Uh, Quentin is a theoretical physicist focusing on high energy phenomena, mostly related to the subatomic world. Uh, Quentin joined UC Berkeley and the Berkeley National Lab as a postdoc a bit more than a year ago. Before that, they spent grad school in uh, Ecole Polytechnique in the suburbs of Paris and in France before becoming a postdoc for three years in Hamburg and northern Germany. In the near future, Quentin will go back to France to join the University of Strasbourg as a junior professor. Quentin is 30 years old, born and raised in France, and really enjoys working in UC Berkeley and more generally living in the, in the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm not sure how many people are on Zoom, but thanks for people who are on Zoom. Um, yeah, I won't have anything else about my curriculum on the slides, but if you're interested in occasionally talking about academia and being a postdoc, things like this, I'm happy to do that as fine. Um, I also have, in principle, one slide of kind of advice for people who would be interested in academia at the end of the talk. And in the meantime, I'm going to talk about these non-dual simulations. So what, what are those? Um, so let's start from the name. So they are, they are bosons. So I guess that some of you may have already, well, may already know what a boson is, but if you're not, it doesn't really matter. You can really exchange that name for a particle for the rest of the talk. It won't, it won't play any role. So bosons are this, are this kind of particles who, which you can stack in quantum states, as the same quantum state are, are, as their friends, which you can do for fermions. But so in principle, those particles I'm going to discuss are bosons, but it doesn't really matter what I'm going to say. So just replace that name by particle everywhere, and that's going to be equally good. The second part of the name is not a physical concept. It's just the name of two people who introduced this, this to us. Uh, one, of, one of them, Nandu, to the left, is a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, at least that's how we, that's the paternity we give to this concept in high energy and particle physics. And in some other contexts, like condensed matter of physics, you may, heard, you may hear of other names like that of Mr. Anderson, also a Nobel Prize winner. Before I tell you more about these bosons, I wanted to first justify why I decided to talk about them. And basically, there are four messages I'd like to, to communicate today. The first one is that they are universal concepts in physics. They are relevant everywhere, so not only in high energy physics or particle physics, which is what I do every day, but also, as I was saying, in condensed matter physics, fluid dynamics, anything. And the reason why they're universal is, not, is that they are not random particles. It's not a particle you can imagine adding or modifying to the, to the theory you have in mind. It's something that is related to the structural properties of physical theories. And hence, they have rigid properties. And they're found um, throughout many phenomena in, in a universal fashion. Something that is also close to my heart is that they, they make the combination of math and physics pretty obvious. And the last thing is not really a point that I can emphasize, it's just they happen to be the same part. So that may sound a bit um, abstract and unclear at the moment, and hopefully during the talk I'll make, I'll make these points a bit, a bit clearer. Okay, so before we discuss the physics of those bosons, I think one has to, to understand or be reminded at least of a very, uh, very related and very important concept, which is the concept of spontaneous to drop and symmetry. So again, some of you may have heard of that. If it's not the case, I'll, I'll give you an intuitive picture of it now. So I think that the like the simplest picture of spontaneous broken symmetries is, let's say you're, there's like a flat, boring landscape with a mountain or a dune on top of it uh, that has this, this uh, symmetric shape that you can rotate around. So then if you, if you happen to sit at the top of that mountain, you look in one direction, you're going to see some landscape. And because of the geometry of, the, of, 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 of this place, if you now turn around and start looking in another direction, you'll see a landscape that is qualitatively the same. So what that means is that if you start probing physics and observing phenomena and trying to describe the laws of physics that you observe, uh, they will be independent whether you, cho you chose the, the axis to describe the events to the axis X and Y to be located, to be like directed in this direction or to rotate them by some angle. In other words, the physics that you could parameterize in terms of this, this axis x, y is independent on the, on the rotation parameterized by, by an angle theta that you could perform on these two axes. 
So this is what we call the rotational invariant here in 2D. Um, but now we, we should think about the experiment of another observer, which is the, ob the observer that like runs around the mountain, the base of the mountain, and it's not at, at the top. So from the point of view of that observer, this, the symmetry is very different. Right? If that observer starts looking around, in one direction there will be a mountain, in the other direction there will be a flat boring landscape. So there's no naive rotation symmetry that this, uh, that this observer experiences. Nevertheless, this landscape and the laws of physics have not changed. And so what used to be the rotational invariance seen from the top must have a manifestation also for that observer. And the manifestation is that when that person looks around and then starts walking and then looks around again, they will see the exact same phenomena. They will describe the, the phenomena they see from these different points uh, in the same way. So if I want to, to express it again in terms of coordinates, that, that, that observer may, may just span the space they observe in terms of the local reference frame X, Y here, and the, the fact that you have a rotational invariance in the situation is that the laws of physics would be the same if you started labeling the space at the point which is located further along that base of the observer. This is still the effect of the genuine exact rotational invariance of the setup, but now it's hidden. It's, uh, it, it, appears, it doesn't appear to this observer as a trivial rotation of the coordinates it, that observer can use um, to label the space. It's, it acts in a different way on this building, but it still, it still exists. And those hidden symmetries um, bear the name of spontaneous supraffine symmetries. Um, that, that, so the title of the slide, and the reason why they're, they're called like this is, is, is understood as follows. So imagine you start at the top of the mountain, and now you'd like to just wander off the base. Uh, you, can, you, you have to start looking in some direction to reach the base, and all the directions are physically equivalent, as we said, but nevertheless, you have to choose one and start looking in that direction to reach the base. And the fact of making that choice is associated to the world's spontaneous in, in the name. And the fact that you're going to go from a position where the, ro the rotation symmetry is kind of obvious to the place where it's hidden is associated to the part as well. That's the, that's the idea behind it. Um, so in this picture, I gave you a description in terms of symmetry for space time. So you move in space time or turn or, or, or move, like walk in some direction in space time. But actually, what's most useful for what I'm going to discuss is the notion of internal symmetries. So it's a symmetry that, so those are the kind of symmetries that don't have any relationship to space time. So you may be used, we just discussed the symmetry and the rotation, but you may be used to the symmetry and the translation where you need to move to another point in space, and the laws of physics also happen to be the same at that new point. If you studied special relativity, you may, you may have heard of the Lorentz transformations that leave the laws of physics independent of space time. So I'm not going to discuss this kind of symmetry. Uh, discuss other kind of symmetries that don't mess up with the structure of space time or with, that, that don't act on the point where you sit. So one intermediate picture for this would be the, the solid with a, or some, some set of atoms, let's say, which have a spin. Sometimes when you go below certain critical temperature, all these spins have to align in some direction. So that's the state that will minimize energy. But if the, if the spins are free to move in three-dimensional space, this configuration and that configuration happen to be equivalent in terms of energy. And the only thing that matters is that all the spin line in some direction. But at some point, they still have to choose a direction, and they're going to choose a random one, uh, realizing again the spontaneous symmetry of rotation. Uh, every direction is equivalent, but at the end, you have to choose one. And you could have chosen any other one, but you nevertheless choose one. So that, that, that would be an example that smells like internal symmetry, because when I discuss the rotation of these spins, I'm not changing the whole of space time, like the shape I, I've drawn, like the shape of that solid constant is kind of fixed, but only the spin will be at the end of the base. So I'm not like, looking at the system from different angles, I'm really changing just uh, just a degree of freedom that leads from the point. Uh, before I make that a bit more abstract, let me highlight the fact that here we find uh, something that is called a different pattern of symmetry breaking from the one we discussed before. So when we thought about the case where we were sitting at the top of the mountain, uh, we had the 2D rotation invariance. So the rotation bias of 2D space is captured by a group. So this, this don't have, you don't have to pay attention to that. I'm just mentioning it for the ones who would be mathematically inclined. But the group that describes all space of uh, the set of all rotations is called SO2. In that case, you have a, in that case of the spin, you have rotation in three-dimensional space. And the group that characterizes all these rotations is called SO3. So in the case before, we had the 2D rotation that was broken to nothing, like the, the, the observer that was sitting at the base of the mountain had no obvious so no of these symmetries around him uh, when, when probing the, the, the landscape. Uh, whereas here in the case of these spins, it's a bit different. So they could 
go anywhere in three dimensions. Uh, they could go anywhere in, in yeah, three dimensions of space, and they chose one dimension. And there remains some symmetry of the configuration, which is that you can still rotate the spin in the dark along the direction that the spin chose. So it's a different, so to this effect, it would be the name that there is a different pattern of symmetry. You had a, a big symmetry that was the symmetry of focus work, which is that you could be broken by choosing one configuration. And there may remain some leftover symmetry once that configuration is, uh, is chosen. So this thing, I'm not going to go back to it very much, but it's extremely important for the, for the physics of Gaussian bosons that I'm going to discuss. And it, it determines how many Gaussian bosons there are and how they interact. But yeah, I'm not going to, to say more about that, but it's an important topic. Good. So this example of the spins can be generalized in a very abstract fashion. So you can, so physics is defined in, in space time. So you have properties of particles or, or fields, magnetic fields, electric fields that are defined at each point in space. So at each point in space, you have a set of degrees of freedom, and those degrees of freedom may live in an abstract space, an abstract vector space. Um, which and then yeah, so at each point, you will have some vector in some abstract space whose uh, whose coordinates depend on the space time. So this we would call the field by analogy with the electromagnetic and magnetic fields, which exactly is what we discussed. So I think with this con with these concepts, I have enough machinery to introduce the, the notion of non degraded bosons, which is the, the, the focus of this talk. So thinking again, thinking again about the picture of fields that characterize how degrees of freedom evolve in space in an abstract vector space. Uh, let me take a point in space and zoom on what's happening to, to the value of the field at that point. So the value of the field takes value in some vector space. So in this picture, I'm deciding that the vector space is two-dimensional. So it's span, it span by this V1 and V2 axis. So here in the, in the, in the slide before, I decided that I, I, I drew a three-dimensional vector space for the sake of just drawing things. It's going to be two-dimensional. So you have a, a vector here whose magnitude and angle and so forth depend on space time. So here's one realization at one point. And the, this vector field will have a dynamic that is encoded in some equation, like some version, something like the Maxwell equation that are valid for this, for this field. And it can have, for instance, a potential. So the value of the field can, can be associated to a potential energy. And that is what I'm going to associate to this, uh, what used to be the mountains in the lecture before. So this thing is telling you how the potential of that vector field evolves as you move in space. So there is at the top, for instance, here, at the origin, you have a higher potential than further away. That's, that's what this picture is depicting. I'm not drawing the potential further away, not to make the, the drawing too crowded, but I have a picture like this in mind, where the potential rise up again as you increase the size, uh, as you increase the magnitude of the vector field, still keeping this rotational symmetry, so still, having, still being independent as I rotate along the central axis. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to draw this whole thing, but just keep in mind that it rises again so that there is a state, there is a configuration of minimal energy that I call the vacuum vector. So it's the, 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 the configuration that has the lowest potential energy here is this circle in, in green that where, where the potential energy reaches its limit. And very much like the electric magnetic field, where you, you may have heard that these fields are associated with particle excitation. So you can you can think about these fields fluctuating, but in in when when you look at very uh, very low in intensity fluctuations of, of these fields, they are they are better described as quantum excitations, which are encoded in, well, which describe the photon particle, the particle that the photon is, and this generalizes to all fields. So all fields in nature have quanta, which we interpret as particles. So the electron and other kind of particles, for instance, can be described in this language. So we have these fields whose excitations are particles. So we still haven't seen Gaussian bosons at that stage, um, but to, to understand where they come from, let, let's remind that this field that, that, that I drew, whose potential I drew in the slide before, evolves in space. So it takes one value at some point in space, it will take another value at some other point in space. If there is no particle, the, the situation should be that the field is aligned in one uniform uh, value everywhere out of space. And ha exciting a particle will mean creating some wave some perturbation, some wave-like perturbation of that field that propagates in time. So to identify the particle, I should imagine that this field, uh, so I have a, like a background value for this field and I turn on some wave-like perturbation and, and I study the properties of this wave-like perturbation and that's, my, that's how particles manifest themselves in this language. And 
what I what I observe in the case of a spontaneous reinforcement system, so in the case where there's a potential and there are configurations of that potential um, for which the symmetry is hidden, I realize that at these points there happens to always be a particle whose dispersion relation, so the relation between energies and momentum, is that of a massless particle. So yeah, so here we have a potential which has again a spherical symmetry that the mountain had before. And I'm looking at the configuration of the field, which is such that at this point, the point here, um, the, the symmetry happen, appears hidden. So if I, if I, if I act with the rotation of, on, on, on that blue vector, I move, it's, the, the configuration is not invariant. And the rotation invariant of the potential is encoded, is encoded now in the fact that any choice of this blue, uh, of this blue arrow on the large circle would be equivalent to but I chose one, so I spontaneously to block that symmetry by making one distribution. This is my vacuum state, and I'm, I'm gonna, now I'm expanding around it to probe the particular, the particle content of the field. And what happens is that when I do this, this perturbation around this randomly chosen vacuum, I observe that there are massless excitations, so particles with no mass associated with the excitation of this field. And, and, and why that happens is, is due to the, to, the, to the underlying symmetry of the potential, namely, moving in this direction, moving in the circle causes no potential energy, and you only need to excite momentum uh, to, to start moving in this direction. The same is definitely not true of the particle excitation that moves in the radial direction. So if you were to excite a quantum of the field in the other direction, the direction that starts climbing the potential well, uh, then you need that this, this quantum particle will feel the potential and, and will have a dispersion relation of mass with time. Good. So the Goldstone boson is this one, the one that is massless, the one that, that inherits from that that, that that inherits a massless dispersion relation from the spontaneous reinforcement system. What's really remarkable about those particles is that their their properties are completely fixed by the symmetry. Their properties do not depend on whether the potential looks like this or this or this. So the detail of the potential does not matter. What on, the only thing that matters is that it has this spontaneous reinforcement symmetry, which here appears like a rotation. Um, and so their properties are fully determined by the symmetry. We don't have to know anything about the full, uh, well, the full uh, shape of the potential. What, or we don't even have to know about the physics that generated it in full detail. We just have to have that information that there is a spontaneous reinforcement symmetry here, a spontaneous reinforcement rotation symmetry in two dimensions. This is true of the, uh, as I was saying a second ago, this is true of the mass. We know that this goes on both into the massless in all configuration, but it, this is also true of the. Uh, of the self interaction that was going on. So in that case, there's only one, but in, in, in more general abstract spaces where the rotation symmetry would be different to rotation symmetry in higher space time dimensions, uh, you would get several ghost numbers out when you break those symmetries, which self interact. And these self interactions are completely fixed by the symmetry, not by the shape of the potential itself. This is also true of when you, when you perform some tiny modification of the picture. So, so if it happened that the picture was a bit tilted, that namely there's no rotational symmetry uh, of the potential, namely there's a side of that circle that has, that has slightly less energy than the side, that this side here. Uh, that modification induces a, a modification of the property of the Goldstone boson that still do not depend on the full potential, but simply depend on the tilt you're imposing to the big circle. So for instance, in that case, there will be some tiny amount of potential energy in this direction, so the Goldstone boson will become massive, but the mass it, it gets only depends on, on, on the tilt you're performing to the whole picture, still not about the details of the full potential. So those particles are extremely, like you, yeah, as, as I'll illustrate later on, they, they share universal properties. And by studying them in one context, you're actually studying them in many contexts. And something else which is super useful from, for instance, from the point of view of particle physics, as I'll try to, to explain, is that they are naturally lighter than other other particles in the spectrum. So for instance, if you remember this radial excitation, so the particle light excitation that goes in the radial direction, this one will have a mass scale that is naturally uh, determined by the slope of that potential. Whereas the Goldstone boson has a mass scale that is determined by this tilt. So by taking them very different, you may find yourself, for instance, by having a very small tilt, so a symmetry that is almost perfect, uh, you'll end up with a Goldstone boson that is not massless, but naturally much lighter than all the other particle light excitations in the theory. And that makes them a very important kind of particle for reasons I'll go back, I'll come back to in a minute. 
Okay, so the, all this was probably a bit abstract or, or, or maybe not of the strictly related physics. So I wanted to give you a an, an, an example of where uh, both and bosons matter for particle physics. It's a very important historical example, and it has to do with some kind of symmetries that I refer to as quark symmetries. You may also hear here of uh, flavor symmetries or power symmetries. Those are names that people also give to these symmetries. And the idea is the following. So, yeah, sorry, let me give you the context why they're important. So you, I guess you, you all know that we have a set of particles that interact together with a different type of force. We have the electromagnetic force, we have the weak force, we have the strong force. Some of these forces we understand very well, like the electromagnetic force is something we, we know how to, well, we know how to predict effects due to the electromagnetic force to extremely good accuracy, for instance, on the way the spin of an electron interacts with the magnetic field, I think is one of the best prediction and measurement in the history of mankind. Uh, but it's not true of all forces. And in particular, if you take the strong force, it's a force we very poorly understand in the sense that we don't, we have very few controlled setups in which we can compute the effects of the strong force and match them to experiment. For instance, here I'm depicting how the strong force, um, how it materiali materializes itself as a function of energy. So if you scatter a particle at high, high energy, like we do in particle colliders, for instance, a good description of the system would be in terms of quarks that exchange gluons. So gluons are the particles that mediate the strong force, like the photon mediates the electromagnetic interaction. So if you start scattering an electron, they would exchange photons, and that's how they interact. And quarks can do the same with photons. So at high energies, that's the right description. But however, at much lower energies, what happens is that physics looks like is is, is phrased in terms of a huge variety of bound states. So yeah, so uh, at high energy, you have a bunch of quarks that interact with gluons, and at, at low energy, you have a bunch of bound states, which look nothing like quarks. There are bound states of quarks that have a part, very particular spectrum interaction and so on, but we don't know how to predict, uh, at least that, that there is no easy way, textbook way, to, to predict what the, what, the, what the properties of these particles are. So for instance, again, some of you may have already studied the hydrogen atom, in the hydrogen atom, we know how to predict the excitation spectrum of the hydrogen atom based on just the, the theory of electron and photon. We can't do that for these particles. So there's no like pen and paper computation of what the property of this particle should be based on the property of quarks and gluons. We have some techniques. So for instance, there's a great technique called lat lattice QCD that, that allows you to get some information. And for instance, I think I, think I took this plot from the paper, but that's precisely, precisely this that predicts the spectrum of those objects. Um, so it's a numerical technique, and I think last, Last, uh, last, in the last series of this, of this lecture, uh, Raoul Tessenio came to talk about that. So probably you can find that online. Um, that's one way, it's, it's one of the only ways. And yeah, matching the two pitch, pictures is otherwise very hard, and it's not something that a, any physicist can do. You need to have these very intensive and, and, and complicated numerical techniques. There are still some things that we can extract which have to do with the physics of Boston bosons, but I'll try to, to explain in a second. So, as I was saying, we don't understand those bound states. There's one limit in which we could understand them is if they, ha they happen to be non-bogosian bosons. So as I was telling you, if some of these bound states happen to be non-bogosian bosons, they have some universal features in their masses and in self interaction and so on that don't really depend on the precise physical setup. They just depend on the symmetry they're associated to. So whatever happens at, in this region where we are matching one high energy description to a simple low energy description of the bound states, if it happens to spontaneously break a symmetry, we don't have to really understand how it does it. That information is enough to say that some of the particles we're going to have high energies happen to be in the bosons with interactions we already understand simply based on the symmetry. So what we should do is to look for a symmetry, a fundamental formulation of quarks and gluons, that would be some abstract version of just rotating space, a more complicated version, but essentially the same. And then we have to, to prove, or at least argue, that this symmetry will be spontaneously broken as we go lower and lower in the future. So that part is hard, but uh, you can do that in several ways. There are analytical arguments that I won't cover that allow you to do this. There are also lattice studies that, so, yeah, that, that prove that this thing happened, or you can also just assume that it happened. The right prediction from the assumption, you just compare them with what you see. All of these uh, approaches seem to agree and, and say that indeed there is some kind of spontaneous breaking of a symmetry induced by the strong force that I'll discuss now. Um, yeah, so these quark symmetries, they are, they are the kind we discussed, namely they are, they are symmetries that act on some degree of freedom in an abstract vector space. Now the vector space we're thinking of is uh, measuring the closeness, if you want. So 
as much as you have the, the electromagnetic field states encode the excitations, which are the photons, you have quark fields, which encode the excitations, which are the photons. So there is a field which can excite the up quark, a field which excites the down quark, a field which excites the change quark, etc. And it happens that there is a, at the level of the strong interactions at least, there is a symmetry. Maybe you can rearrange, you can relabel what you call an up quark and turn it into a combination of what you used to call a strange down quark. And the same for all the other, all, all these three quarks. And it happens that the strong interaction don't differentiate. Well, the strong interaction, like the, the, the defining equations of motion, if you want, like the max, the strong quark Maxwell equation, if you want, happen to be invariant when you start relabeling those those quarks, those those, those quark types. And that that's roughly speaking the quark symmetry I'm talking about. So why should that be true? Well, you just have, for instance, you can you can look at the fundamental theory of, of quark and gluons and check how the up quark and the down quark uh, interact with gluons, and they happen to interact exactly the same way, which I'm depicting like this. It's not meaning much for you, but I'm just saying, I just want to, you to see that it's the same picture. Um, you may also wonder why, uh, why does he only represent the three quarks, which are up, down, and strange quark, and six quarks, rather the three others. And it happens to be that only the, the symmetry that, that like, mixes the three quarks is a good symmetry uh, of the strong interactions. The reason is that masses of quarks kind of differentiate them. So the strange quark, the up quark, and the down quark have slightly different masses. But those masses are much, much smaller than the typical scales of the bound state. So if you take a photon, it has a size and a mass that define the scale, and the same for the excitations of the strong quarks, which lie in the several hundred and what mega electron volts. And the masses of these three quarks are much bigger. So from the point of view of the strong quarks, these masses are like just a tiny computation. And whether you're going to bound the S or down quark, not very much of it in the data. This is definitely not true of the three other quarks. The charm bottom and top quarks are much heavier than that scale. So this strong, this strong quark dynamics will definitely differentiate between a super heavy top quark and, and a very light up quark. So that's why these three quarks are singled out and, they, and, and these three light ones are kept. So, and the symmetry we're studying is at the level of these three light quarks. And okay, that's a symmetry, that may look odd, but that's a symmetry, and it happens to be spontaneously broken by strong interaction. Those are actually strong, strong interaction because they, they, they break them when the strong interaction become, enter the regime in which we don't know how to perform con uh, control calculations like we do in, the, in electromagnetic field. So yeah, maybe I should skip over that, but we, as I was telling, the symmetry that's important and, and what it's important and who is important to determine the physics of quantum photons. So here, there's a symmetry group that is SU3 times SU3. You can, you can really think of this as just rotation in three dimensional space time. It's not exactly that because we're dealing with complex numbers. But it's essentially the same, broken to one only version of this rotation. You may wonder why you have two. We just have three quarks. And the reason why we have two is that if you think of a quark with a momentum, this quark has two states. It's a spin one. We say it's a spin one a half fermion, so it has a spin. And this spin is in two states. I, this can be in two states, the, the, the state where it's aligned with the momentum and the state where it's misaligned with the momentum, uh, anti-aligned with the momentum. And actually it happens that you, in the two theory of some interactions, you can rotate independently the three kind of quarks that have this configuration and independently the three kind of quarks that have this configuration. Hence the two independent symmetry groups. Okay, you can run the theory of Goldstone boson that I haven't made it explicit, but the result is that eight Goldstone bosons are expected uh, for this pattern of symmetry breaking. And you can look for them in the spectrum of, of strong of the strong form of the strong force resonances. And here they are. You find eight lightish particles, which are the pion and the, the kaons, which have exactly the right up and up, down, and strange quark uh, contents to, to, to be these Goldstone bosons. And, and they also fit the picture quite well. I was telling you before that we expect these Goldstone bosons to be much lighter than the rest of the physics that that, that arises because the rest of the physics sees the size and the slope of this potential, whereas the Goldstone bosons only see only, only the mass of the Goldstone boson is only sensitive to this tilt. So here, this tilt is in terms of the quark masses, which kind of differentiate the three kinds of quarks and make the, this relabeling between all kinds of quarks that we mentioned not an exact symmetry. So this is the reason be, behind the tilt, and this gives a small mass, a com computable mass to these Goldstone bosons, which exactly fit what we see here. There's, an other, there's another effect, which is that up and down quark have different electromagnetic charges, but otherwise, yeah, that's the picture. And as I was saying, their set interactions are predicted. So just from this, just from this idea that they break the symmetries, you can compute at leading order the interactions between pions and the, 
So this is by Jungian, this is by Jungian Keon, for instance. And they happen to very well compare, match what we've seen. This is a very, this is, this is a, one of the great successes of the theory of strong interactions. Uh, and the theory that describes Payon and Keon is called Carroll's attraction theory. You may, you may hear of, of it one day. And yeah, well, I think I've already said that mass spectrum is quite big. And we know exactly what the field of the potential is. What we don't understand is that potential, that, that very strong interaction relate. We don't understand. That's the part we don't know how to compute. But we understand that tiny field, the tiny field from quark masses and electromagnetic masses. So from this tiny field that we understand, we can predict the spectrum of these pions and kerns, and it happens to, to, to match what we observe at the orbit. OK, so all, all this was the view of non physics, and I wanted to tell you a bit more about what we do in, in, in particle physics labs these days, at least in theoretical particle physics labs like, like the one I belong to. And most, most of the, the places where those and bosons appear in this modern research has to do with hypothetical symmetries. And these symmetries we have not yet observed, for example, the quark symmetries we have observed it. We have observed quark, we can we can think about these symmetries. And we can also invent new theories that have extended structures, not just the ones we've already probed, and they can come with new symmetries. And this kind of symmetry is an object to think of. And we think of it for the reason I, I alluded to earlier, namely if these new symmetries that we're hypothesizing uh, happen to be spontaneous of Rakan, it's expected that the Gaussian bosons that, that arise are much lighter than the rest of the system. So if this is the case, and we, uh, we build a larger particle collider, let's say to probe higher and higher energies, it is expected that we first are going to produce and observe that light, uh, that light physics. So it could also be that this light physics is already around us, whereas all the rest is, is much heavier. So that gives you a motivation for why you should care. So this, these things can nature, these Gaussian bosons from hypothetical symmetries can naturally be lighter. And we should naturally be thinking about them around us, even if the rest of the, the, rest of the physics that gives rise to this whole potential is much, much heavier and we haven't seen it. Another reason why you should care, well, why you may want to care, you should care, but why you may want to care is that, as I was telling you, if you give me a symmetry breaking pattern, you tell me there's some kind of rotation at high energies that is spontaneous of Rakan. Um, this information is enough for, for me to predict what the self interaction should be between the Gaussian bosons and also what the interaction with the matter I know should be at the order. So, thanks to this, you can analyze the physics of these Gaussian bosons in a universal way. You can just perform one big study that applies to many, many models you can imagine that, would, that may be models of nature at, at much smaller scale. So for instance, with uh, some, some question we like to ask is, are neutrinos their own antiparticles, uh, which is an open possibility. And there are models of, of like models of nature at smaller scales where this is forbidden by asymmetry. But this symmetry would, may, may be spontaneously broken, in which case the neutrinos which emerge at, lower en at low energies can again be their own antiparticles because the symmetry is hidden there, it's not going to work. But there is, so there are many models that do this, but there is one uh, obvious, well, irreducible prediction of all those models is that there is a Gaussian boson associated with the protein of this, this symmetry, what we call the myon. You could also ask, is there a structure behind the fact that we have three generations of matter? So as you probably heard of, there is an electron, so there is a two heavy version of the electron, the muon and the tau, and the same for all particles we see all fermions we see, sorry, all quarks and leptons. And we don't understand that. We, we, we don't understand why it's the case. And there are theories, again, people have invented, invented theory of, theories of nature of the, uh, at, at, the, at the smallest scales where there is a symmetry reason behind it. The, two, the, three generations, the three generations have to be there because of some symmetry structure. And that symmetry has to be spontaneously broken so that we don't, and we don't see it actually what's going on in the three generations at the other end of the spectrum. So again, there are many models that do this with diff very different predictions, but there is one universal prediction, which is that there is a, a Gaussian boson associated with that protein, which we may call the Fermilon. And one very popular example of, of Gaussian bosons these days are what we call QCP artifacts. And they are associated to all models that solve that, well, to, to a, a large class of models that answer the question, why do strong interactions respect CP? CP is a symmetry that is the symmetry, sorry, um, Respecting CP means that you look at the world, if you look at the world through a mirror and in your head relabeling what particle and antiparticle anti mean, then you would see exactly the same thing as if you are not doing this. And it's a symmetry that is not exact. So if you do this in the real world, taking into account all phenomena that doesn't, that doesn't, that is broken by the weak interaction. Weak interactions appear differently if you look at them through a mirror, relabeling particles and antiparticles. 
But if you only focus on strong force processes, so processes where only the strong force is active, they seem to be exactly, this symmetry seems to be exactly respected. And there is no reason for that that we understand. So it's a, one of the puzzles that theorists of particle physics try to solve. And there are solutions where you, again, you introduce, you imagine a theory that has some kind of symmetry in between, that is in, in high energy, sorry, that is spontaneously broken. Um, and there are many models that do that, that have a universal prediction, which is that there is a light field component that arises whose name is the QCD axiom. And there may be symmetries whose Gaussian depth has not yet been thought of. So there may be symmetries we haven't thought of that are spontaneously broken, and they just may give us a broken version, light field component. They, that may be the way we understand that there is a big symmetry. And actually, these, these new symmetries arise in, in, in many constructions, many theoretical constructions that we introduce to explain puzzles like dark matter or dark energy the cosmological inflation, or even the Higgs boson could be uh, interpreted as a ghostly boson in, in, in more, in, in, yeah, in, in refined models of nature. So yeah, I, so to, to, to convince you of the fact that you can analyze all those models at once, uh, because the, 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 the physics of ghosts and bosons is kind of universal, I wanted to discuss the case of the coupling of a ghost and boson to two protons. So a ghost and boson that I'm calling A here, for A for axion actually, um, can interact with two photons, so the, the, yeah, this, this in fun, yeah, you can think of this as an interaction in, in space where a photon keeps an axon um, but, and, and absorbs it, but you can also think of this as an abstract coupling in the, in the equation of motion of the theory. But the fact that the axon is a Boltzmann boson imposes that this coupling is unique. It has this form, so there is one number, GA gamma gamma, which is a dimension full number, but it's just a number. This, this thing is a tensor, it's just a bunch of numbers. It's a, it's a tensor, of, it's a fully anti-symmetric tensor in four dimensions, so it's a bunch of one minus one is zero. These are the momenta of the photon, and these are the polarization of the two photons. So if you check, if you choose the polarization, the photons to be linearly polarized or circularly polarized, that will uh, choose, what this, that will determine what this epsilon is. And yeah, that's the only thing that can show up and that is imposed by the structure of both and bosons. Whatever the model you're building that gives, that give ri gives rise to this boson, this Gaussian boson, that's the only possibility. And that allowed people to look for the effect of these Gaussian bosons in a completely model independent way. So as soon as there is one Gaussian boson that happens to map to, to the photon, you can look for it without having to specify which model this is, right? So, so you can find it in the literature plots like this one, that only depend on two coefficients, the Gaussian boson mass and its coupling to photons. And then you can plug all possible searches on it, and it's a, it's a plot that is valid for all of these models. Uh, all models that give you a, a Gaussian boson that flow energy. So, for instance, yeah, you have like cosmological probes, you have collider probes that are hidden, you have like lab, laboratory, labo, laboratory probes, dark matter probes, many things like this that you can pack on these on this plots, and they're, they're just they're universal things that you can recycle. Whatever the model you think of should be the model of nature, as long as it gives rise to Gaussian bosons that propose two photons. Yeah, sorry, I think I put how long should I? Okay, let me try to, to cover that. So again, I, I'm, okay, I don't know how I'm doing so far, but this part will probably be a bit, a bit hard to follow, but I, I'm happy. I just want to stress, to, to highlight some results, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about them or suggest where you could read about them. I wanted to finish by talking about this, to this topic of anomalies. So I was telling you that in some cases, there is a slight tilt in this potential that, that gives the Gaussian boson a mass that is computable, as we've seen by the case of strong forces. Uh, the strong force bound states that and this thing is you can think about this in an abstract way in principle what happens is that like the classical equations of motion in theory already have this tilt in it this is in the case of, of, the, of the interaction between quarks and gluons the, the quark masses is something that shows up in these equations of motion and break the symmetry and and provide this tilt there's a very uh, fascinating phenomenon that has been identified in the 70s which is that this tilt can happen by the mere existence of spin one particles. So by spin one, I mean something like the photon in the form of gluons. So what that means is that even if you were to think about equations of motion that have an exact symmetry for which this potential is flat, or sorry, for which this potential is not tilted, sorry, um, but you, you try to also couple this theory to, to gluons, for instance, quantum mechanics will be such that you can't avoid the fact that the tilt will be uh, generated. So to put it in a probably obscure way, uh, the mathematics of spin one and quantum mechanics can be at odds with exact symmetry. So even if you are imposing at the classical level, let's say some kind of Maxwell equation that has an exact symmetry, 
uh, it could be that the quantum mechanics or the quantum version of this dynamics does not respect the symmetry you try to impose. So that goes under the name of anomalies, and it's a very, very important effect that has been well understood and well and observed, actually, in, in, in pion physics. And, and it has an interesting application that people think of nowadays in the context of the QCD action that I mentioned. So if this tilt is provided by the strong force, so the, the kind of spin one particle that we know, the gluons, um, this point here happens to be the minimum of the theory. So the, 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 sorry, the, the point uh, of the theory, the point where the potential energy of the theory is, is the minimal one. So that's what we will call the, the vacuum. And it happens that this point is exactly the point where the strong interactions respect this symmetry CP that I told you about, the one where you look to the mirror and relabel particles with different properties when you exchange them. This weird symmetry uh, that we don't understand why it is preserved at the level of the strong interaction processes happens to be, if, if the potential of the, of the model is like this, it will be naturally explained. So in the standard model, so in our understanding of particle physics, we live somewhere in that circle, but we are fixed for the frozen at one point of the, in that circle. If it happens that there is a particle that makes that circle dynamical, that can just roll along that circle, it will naturally roll to that point, which is the minimum of the theory. And the particle that could do that is what we call the QCD axis. It's not a particle we've seen, it's a particle that can exist, and that would explain why we happen to be exactly at that point where the string interaction is respects. So that's the, the reason behind this thing. Well, this would, in principle, explain it in a bit more detail, in a bit more detail what I told you about this. So it's something that, for instance, here at Berkeley in the, in the, in the theoretical particle physics uh, group, we, we tend to laugh a lot and study a lot. And we study models of that sort, the cosmology of this the action and so on, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very important particle from the theoretical perspective and also something we could solve or, or, or detect in the near future. Lots of efforts have been devoted to the search of that. Anyway. So this concludes the scientific part of uh, my talk. So here are the, 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 the lessons I, I presented at the beginning. Hopefully some of them are, still, are, are more clear now, especially the fact that, that there are universal concepts in both buildings, and that they are associated to structural properties of physical theories, in particular the symmetries that these theories have and how they are broken when you look at them from, from the low energy perspective where they might be hidden because they are spontaneously broken by the dynamics of the theory. Um, yeah, I wanted to finish. I was told that it may be useful for some people to, to, to reflect a bit on our, to, yeah, on, on what we think of academia or, to, or, or some advice for people who would be interested in this. So I decided to devote one slide to that. So, okay, I'm sorry. I, I took, now I'm going to talk to people who may consider a career in academia. And I apologize if, if all of you are not interested. But uh, yeah, there's one first message that I wanted to convey, which is that uh, academia is a tough career, but maybe it's very competitive. It's also an amazing one. Namely, it's when you work in academia, you have an amazing freedom. You can ask questions that, passion, that you're passionate about, not that, that, not that you're forced to solve. You're dealing with questions at the edge of knowledge. Every, every day you, you meet colleagues which are passionate about what they do and so on. So if you feel that you would be excited about that, that you would be a passionate researcher and so on, I think you should definitely not censor yourself for any reason. We, try, we, we are extremely happy to have people like this. And young people like this definitely contribute a lot to the dynamism of, of, of lab. So if, if you feel that these kind of ideas suit you, you should definitely consider okay, academia. Of course, the downside of the statement is academia is an amazing career, but a tough one. Uh, it's a very competitive place. And, and in particular, I think that it's extremely important that if someone interested in academia knows the rules and the sociology of, of, of what he's doing, um, because it's not just about being clever or, or being interested. You, you also have not to make some mistakes and ask the right, the right questions at the right time. And to make that happen, I would suggest that people get exposed to research as early as possible and as much as possible so that people know the, the options, know what's out there, what kind of questions asked, and they have a whole vision of, 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 of the paradigm of research these days so that they can choose what suits them with the maximum amount of information. It's also important to ask for opinions. For instance, if you're looking for grad school, or if you need an advisor or something, most, like, probably most people will not answer to emails, but I'm sure that some people have really formal opinions behind closed doors. I think that's uh, an, an important thing for everyone to consider. So it's a career that you have to be very fast, and you have not, you don't want to make mistakes. But anyway, with this, I, I thank you for listening.
thank you for the great talk. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. Could you repeat the question? Oh yeah. So I was asking whether, so there, there's this kind of, of clusters that I discussed, which is the dorsum boson of what we call, of, of the, of, there's a symmetry that we call letter number that counts less than, but the, the, the neutrino has count as one, and everything counts as one, and the fourth counts as zero. So this, this counting of particles is, is a possible symmetry that would be, that would be broken if neutrinos are their own inside particles. So one neutrino could become a minus one, so uh, nine neutrino become minus one if it's, if they are the same particles as a flash. So people have postulated that maybe in, at high energy, this thing emerges, but the dynamics spontaneously breaks this, so that it's possible to have a dilation if it's neutral and apparent dilation if it's neutral at low energy, which leads to a dorsal boson that is called IR. So I was asking whether it's ruled out, maybe it's being excluded by, I don't know, some search or there's nothing for that. And I said that I don't know, <laughs> and that uh, maybe the physics is just like paper that is obvious, but there are loopholes. Maybe in the part of the The broken symmetry? Yeah, so, so you, when, when you build the theory of particles, you have like the dynamical the equation of motion, so that, that, that theory. So, for instance, like uh, the Maxwell equation, you build it. Equation of motion for a theory of protons. It tells you how the electric and magnetic field uh, propagate. In. So that's one piece of information which tells you what are the constraints on the dynamics. There, there's a second piece of information which is the vacuum of the field. So the point around which you perturb to define what the particle is. So in, in the case of electric and magnetic field, for instance, the vacuum is like zero electric, zero magnetic field. That's the vacuum of the theory. And adding some quanta around this, some photons start building up an electric field. So that's how you do so. A spontaneously broken symmetry is, is a symmetry so that the vacuum states does not respect the symmetry. So you have a bunch of possible vacuum states. They're all equivalent, but you have to choose one to define your theory. Like a theory exists around one of these vacuum states. So in this picture of the of the mountain, I was showing it before I'll just Uh, yes, where was the way? Yeah, you take this picture here. Flashed. Yeah, we left take that picture here. So this is the potential of the theory. If, if you imagine like, let's say you, you, you want to drop a ball that undergoes some friction, and it, this ball is gonna stabilize itself uh, on, on somewhere here. But somewhere you don't know where, but if you put the ball at the top of, the, of this potential hill, you wait for some random click of some sort to, to manifest itself, and the ball is going to roll in one direction. And it could roll in all directions, but it had to pick one. And the fact that it picked one is what spontaneously propagates the matrix. But um, all of these choices were possible, and you had to pick one. And then you're defining particles are, as excitations around that point. And they are not excitations around the point where rotation would appear trivially, and you really like just setting the two coordinates and leaving them rotation. It appears, so the, the model is defined at that point where rotation means going in this direction. And the fact that it, that, that it manifests itself, itself in this way uh, has a certain problem. Does it look like that? Matters of symmetry and other kinds of symmetries in those systems, but what I'm wondering is in the theory itself, do these fields ever influence each other or are they they're mostly kind of separate from each other? I, Especially I, those fields. Okay, so I haven't yeah, I'm probably not the right person to I can tell you how I've not studied the history of these fields very much and I, I personally don't spend much time thinking about them in my theory. I can tell you that I don't have this kind of uh, I, I know for a fact I think that the I know for a fact but um, they have influenced each other in some aspects. Like I think, for instance, the Higgs mechanism 
because it's described that it wasn't in how some some one chain to the map in the panel, and then this mechanism has been discussed also in the paper. And it's not actually in the presentation. Um, nowadays, I know people who discuss kind of some sort of symmetries, have, which are hypothetical in the high energy particle physics community, but are actually very rare in the uh, language. So there are, there are some theories that we think of and we like to see in particle physics, like Martin Elide, I think, in matter. So in, in, at that level, we can imagine. So they are not exactly the same in, in the condensed matter uh, case. Those are kind of effective description. When you zoom in, you see a bunch of atoms and everything is interacting. But if you, if you want to calculate some like large scale uh, behavior of materials, I think you may rely on some theories that have been to discuss in, in high energy physics for particle physics. So I, I definitely think that this is something that has been discussed. And uh, yeah, there are some advanced, like I can think of symmetries these days that emerged in the in the condensed matter theory community and that are now very very famous in the particle physics community. So this thing is definitely happening. So some of the things are, are, are common. Okay. 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 No more questions. Thank you. Speak a little more time. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks.